D&D, Dungeons and Dragons. Over the last 10 years, Dungeons and Dragons has seen a meteoric rise in popularity, growing from a game that was once for losers, nerds, and social outcasts to a game for everyone. D&D even receiving its own movie as well as becoming a full-time job for many content creators out there. However, despite all this positivity and success, D&D at times can't seem to break free from its bad actors and remnants from a time long past. Hello everyone, I'm Finn. Welcome back to Finn Films. Join me today as we are once again diving down the rabbit hole that is D&D horror stories as today we are exploring the story of the downfall of one of the biggest D&D Dungeons and Dragons content creators in the space. A man who built his brand on consent only to, well, turn around and break it. A man named Adam Cobill. Before we get into the insanely cringe story of the downfall of Adam Cobill, first we need to uh, get a little bit of a history lesson so we can kind of set the stage for what is to come. Dungeons and Dragons was first created and published in 1974 by Gary Gygax, and over the years has gone through a number of editions, each edition changing certain elements of the rule and game mechanics, along with expanding player classes as well as player races and all sorts of different types of monsters just as an example. However, D&D throughout a majority of its lifetime has seen nowhere near the amount of success that it's seen in the last 10 years. Here's the amount of mainstream success and acceptance that we've seen since the release of D&D 5e. Dungeons & Dragons throughout the 70s, 80s, and even the 90s was largely a male-dominated game reserved for theater creative nerds and social outcasts. Now, there's a large variety of reasons why this would be the case, but that doesn't really matter that much. All that really matters is that there was a bit of a stigma that developed around D&D and the people who played D&D. Largely, this was due to the Satanic Panic, a moral panic that spread all across the country and even across the world to some degree throughout the 70s, 80s, and even the 90s. Many parents believing that D&D, Dungeons & Dragons, was somehow linked to... Now get this, Satan worship and i.e. real life crimes. They have green looking skin and they run around screaming we love Satan, we want to eat babies. I have them on video. I've done a whole video on the insanity that was the satanic panic in the 80s, so if you want to learn more about that in detail, then I'll link the video uh, here in the eye above as well as in the description box down below. All of this is to say is that a certain kind of stigma developed around the game, tabletop role-playing games in general, and people who played the game, and thus a type of like defensive community and culture began to kind of percolate, began to spread, a culture really of an old boys club, a culture of gatekeeping sexism, and elitism. Of course, that is to say that this is not everyone who played Dungeons and Dragons throughout this time, but it is important to note and acknowledge that this culture very much did exist, and it very much was prominent for a long time, and to some degree that culture still exists today in the D&D and tabletop role-playing game space, though not nearly as large as it once was, having a much smaller impact on the much bigger community that it is now uh, in the late 2020s, uh, but it's important to understand that this was a lot of people's experience with D&D really up until the release of 5e in 2014. Okay, now enter our story creator, writer, game designer, and dungeon master Adam Cobill. Adam first began to rise in the tabletop RPG D&D community around 2012 with the release of Dungeon World, a narrative rules light system that he co-created. This system was a pretty big hit within the uh, tabletop RPG community, and Adam began to establish himself in said community with all of this exposure from his game, as well as making himself known as a dungeon master and becoming an influential figure within the D&D scene. A few years later, in 2014, the newest edition of Dungeons & Dragons D&D 5e would be published, completely reigniting and changing the tabletop role-playing game space altogether, and within just a few years, D&D would be catapulted into the mainstream, the rise of D&D very much coinciding with the rise of Twitch and live streaming culture. Live streaming a D&D game became kind of a core factor for the popularity and this massive growth of D&D as a subculture across the world. Many Dungeons & Dragons 
Dragons live streaming shows and YouTube shows getting launched at this time at the release of 5e from 2014 to 2016. For example, Dice Camera Action featuring uh, Chris Perkins, Acquisitions Incorporated, which also features Chris Perkins and a number of employees from Wizards of the Coast, the company that owns Dungeons and Dragons, and obviously Critical Role, the most popular and most successful D&D live streaming show to date. This game growing so large that this group of just nerdy ass voice actors and friends grew to an entire production company. This show, this D&D show, even getting their own animated series on Amazon Prime Video. Adam Cobill as well would also very much flourish in this environment, this environment of streaming on Twitch and YouTube, combined with a surge in popularity for D&D with D&D 5e. As Adam would leverage his status that he had gained with the in the RPG community with the release of Dungeon World, and would begin running his own D&D uh, live streams in around 2014. These live streams featured a number of kind of popular creators within the RPG space, such creators as the YouTuber It Me JP, and soon Adam, along with Itmay GP and two other dungeon masters, Stephen Lumpkin and Neil Erickson, better known as Koibu, started a show and a channel, a channel called Roleplay. Adam would continue his rise a year later, becoming the DM in residence for Roll20, Roll20 being the largest online tabletop service at the moment, at least at the time of recording. And in just the span of a year or more, Adam became easily one of the biggest figures within the D&D space. Adam as well around this time began to market himself as a kind of representative for the socially conscious of the tabletop role-playing game and D&D scene. As for years, as we said at the beginning of the video, this space, the D&D space, had been a bit of a reputation for being an old boys club and had a reputation for gatekeeping, sexism, elitism, just general antisocial behavior had run amok in this space for many, many years. However, with the release of D&D 5e and this massive blow up of the popularity of, um, of the hobby, D&D had suddenly entered into a new era. The world had grown much more progressive and the simplification of D&D 5e and its rule set had seen the hobby really spread fa far and wide to all sorts of people all over the world. It wasn't just the male dominant nerd space anymore that it had previously once been. Now D&D was a game for everyone, no matter what your gender, your identity, uh, or your background was. People from all shapes and sizes, from all backgrounds were now well welcomed into D&D from the biggest jocks to the biggest celebrities. Adam really tried to put himself at the forefront of this movement, actively pushing back against the white male domination in the tabletop role-playing game space and encouraging player agency, inclusivity, and actively pushing the ideas of D&D as a safe space. Of course, the irony of all of this is, is that ultimately Adam would reveal himself as the thing that he so publicly pushed back against and to me, that is just hilarious irony. It also really brings to mind another certain dungeon master who I covered on this channel who positioned himself in a similar type of way. Yeah, I'm talking about Arcadum. However, we're getting way ahead of ourselves now. At this point in our story, roleplay as a channel was really in its ascendancy, though behind the scenes, a bit of trouble began to brew. Specifically, trouble between the Dungeon Masters, the three group of Dungeon Masters, and the uh, channel's main creator, the YouTuber ItMeJP. As the channel had grown very quickly into one of the largest tabletop role-playing game franchises, these three DMs wanted to renegotiate formal contracts with the creator, ItMeJP, and they chose Adam to represent them. However, what they didn't expect was for Adam to double cross them. These negotiations that Adam led did not in fact result in new contracts with better terms for all three DMs. No, in fact, they resulted with Adam being the sole game master for Roleplay the channel. With Steven and Neil being completely kicked to the curb, shown the door, fired, your services will no longer be needed anymore, and it was told to the Roleplay fans that, uh, Get this, Steven and Neil stepped away from the project willingly because they had other commitments. The truth of what actually happened here wouldn't come out for some time until both Steven and Neil had made public statements on Twitter. From here on though, with no one knowing what had happened behind the scenes, Adam was the king of roleplay. It was his show, baby. He was now the sole IP, the sole creator working within the roleplay space, the channel I mean, and he enjoyed all of the benefits of now being heralded as one of the greats of GMing. From here, Adam's profile as a dungeon master really 
only began to rise and it coincided with the rise of live streaming, specifically live streaming with D&D. In just the span of like a few years, Adam had risen from a simple game developer, a game developer of a tabletop RPG, to one of the most popular and influential dungeon masters and voices in the D&D space, being heralded as one of the greats of dungeon mastering, uh, being lifted to the DM uh, Mount Rushmore with the likes of Chris Perkins, Matt Mercer, and Brennan Lee Mulligan. Adam began running even more shows and games on roleplay and began popping up and collaborating with all sorts of other like prominent members of the D&D space. However, things were all about to come crashing down for Mr. Cobill. Now cast your minds back to 2020. COVID is in full swing, toilet paper is in short supply, and lockdown is in full effect. People are stuck in their homes, so Twitch.tv has seen a massive rise in users because, well, what else are people supposed to do when they aren't allowed to touch grass? At this time, Adam is running a number of games, one of them being the second season of Far Verona. And this is where things start to go horribly wrong. One of these players on Far Verona was a woman named Elspeth Eastman, an actress and composer who has worked on games such as League of Legends and Cadence of Hyrule. In this episode, her character, a robotic bartender named Johnny, went to see a friend for repairs and upgrades. Now, just a little warning here, the clip that I'm about to show you is uh, one of the most cringe and uncomfortable things that you will ever see in your life. So if you'd like to be spared this, then uh, go ahead and skip to the time I'm on screen now. He says to you, he's like, don't be scared. I've done it before. I can show you. He picks up some kind of like device, right? It's got a plug on one end and some buttons on the handle. And he says, um, I'm just, I'm going to do it real gentle the first time. And you tell me how it feels. Okay. This is, he places the edge of the, of the device against the port and he presses a button and Johnny has for the first time in his entire life, whatever the equivalent of a robot orgasm, right there, it hits you like a truck. Your, uh, your vision like flickers and blurs, uh, your temperature sensors all go haywire for just a second, uh, your, your knees buckle slightly. <laughs> and I think maybe that's the last shot. I think that's the shot of the episode, is Johnny uh, getting his brain stimulated. <laughs> I feel like this is where Johnny should shout for help. F Yikes, bro. In summary, the mechanic character, an NPC which was played by the DM, Adam Cobill, violated the robotic bartender, forcing the character to, well, get off, if you know what I mean. You have a poison in your mind, and the fact that you can't see it makes me so sad. I remember being on the internet like not long after this happened because this clip went f viral. And of course it did because it's insane. And one of the most cringe things that I've ever seen on the internet. I mean, look at the looks on the player's face. Look at how uncomfortable they are. I think this really just says it all. In the meanwhile, Adam is just giggling and laughing his ass off, uh, laughing his way through this this description of what is happening, which is basically SA. The session would end basically right after this scene, Adam in a post-session discussion, uh, responding to the player's protest about said scene with a, uh, robots need love too. <laughs> robots need love too. <laughs> That's right, we have to start every episode with an explosion. So... <laughs> okay. All right, so, uh... That, that happened, I guess. Stop it. Get some help. Remember that for years now, up until this point, Adam had built his reputation as the socially conscious DM, the dungeon master who advocated for consent and inclusivity in his games and sought to move away from this old boys club stereotype. Yet what he just did on a live stream in front of hundreds of people to a female player's character spat in the face of all of that. And at no point during this scene did he ask if any of the players were fine with this. Did he ask if any of the players might be uncomfortable? 
All the meanwhile, he's just giggling to himself like a complete and utter freak. Personally, to me, I, it's probably never a good idea to roleplay some freaky shit in your D&D &D game. But like, if you're gonna do it, then you need to get expressive consent from all the players at the table. And these players should probably be close friends. But t to me, this almost always ends horribly. And horribly, it did end for Adam Cobill. The fallout to this was immediate. Remember, this entire thing was live streamed, so within an hour, clips were taken and posted all throughout the internet, one of them making it to the subreddit live stream fails, and it began circulating to all of the Twitch zeitgeist. In an official video released a few days later, Adam would announce that the uh, show was being put on an indefinite hiatus, and Adam would address the uh, situation, address this segment, apologizing, but then putting the blame on poor implementation of consent tools that he had apparently designed. Fortunately, for whatever reason, uh, we didn't put any safety measures in place to prevent that discomfort while it was occurring. So as a result, uh, we're going to be canceling future episodes of Far Verona season two until we can work out what's next. This shifting of the blame, though, did not go over well with the fans of roleplay and really the larger D&D community as a whole, uh, specifically with the player herself, Elspeth Eastman, who then released her own video in response to uh, Adam's video saying that uh, she was quitting the show and putting Adam on blast. Then seeing Rocket's disappointment, he says, hey, I'm down for new adventures. What does that mean to Johnny? Definitely not what happened next, which was getting an orgasm plugged into his sockets with some device that Rocket claims he's used many times. The kicker here is that before the episode, Adam wanted to know more about story arcs that I envisioned for Johnny. I said he definitely wanted upgrades to get rid of that bit crusher on his voice. We wanted to know more about the bartender who replaced Johnny. And specifically, I wanted Johnny to be able to say no to more people, including his friends. The way the episode ended was Johnny laying down willingly and then having this completely alien sensation happen. He was expecting upgrades. He barely has the concept of romance. Then Adam ends the episode there, leaving no room for Johnny to refuse or even just punch Rocket for violating his space. It felt very premeditated, and I was shocked and angry. After everything went down and people were expressing their discomfort, I messaged Adam saying that this was not what I envisioned for Johnny. He apologized for misreading my intent. I'm not sure how one could misread the intent to get fixed up as, let's give this guy an orgasm, but it happened despite the red flags anyway. I lost faith and trust in Adam as a GM, even after role-playing with him before. Hell, I might have even lost faith in him as a friend. Adam continues to say that the game mechanics were not properly in place and that as a group, we should have discussed this prior to starting the show. Sure, that's a good idea in hindsight, but if you need to have a talk with your cast beforehand that you're planning on introducing a sexual predator NPC to one of their characters, I guarantee you not one person would be okay with that, especially not in front of hundreds of people. This isn't a question about what have, could, could have prevented it when Adam is literally the one in charge. After rewatching the episode multiple times, I was no longer open to having my character or my name tied to this story, so I quit. For now, these are my thoughts and feelings on the matter. To all the fans of the show and of Johnny, I thank you for watching, and thanks for hearing me out. Stay safe, stay healthy, peace. In response, Adam released another official apology on Twitter the next day. At this point, it though, it had been 10 days since this original incident that occurred in the game, a 10 days filled with massive backlash and hate against Adam as, uh, well, his apology was just nowhere near good enough. Though the backlash and hate was extremely loud, it is important to note that Adam still had a large chunk, a large core of his fan base that did still support him through this, many believing that what Adam did really wasn't that big of a deal, some even thinking that this is going completely blown out of proportion, and he did nothing wrong. From here, Adam Cobill would disappear from the internet for nearly two months until May 31st, 2020, Adam making a post in response to the Black Lives Matter movement and the death of George Floyd. This, uh... This did not go over well with uh, many people in the D&D community, as some people would accuse Adam of trying to take advantage of a very bad situation as a means to try to re-enter into the internet in a more positive light. Adam would once again disappear from the internet for about a week until he published an article on his personal blog titled 
moving on. In the article, Adam would discuss his rise to prominence as a dungeon master in the D&D space, uh, how he became a influencer and a creator. Adam going into a detailed three paragraph explanation, explaining the scary and daunting realities of what it means to be an online creator and the burden of being a streamer. The psychology of Twitch broadcasting is insidious. Every time a subscription notification appeared, I felt a hit of dopamine that drove me to continue. Every positive tweet or forum post celebrating something I'd been a part of helped me conceal the reality of things. I was wearing thin. That cycle of sacrifice and accolades gave me an excuse to push well past the limits of my mental and physical health. My entire life revolved around work. I knew it wasn't good for me, but I couldn't stop. This was the price I thought we all paid for success. This was how it worked. Finally, after three long paragraphs of wallowing in self-pity and his success as a content creator, Adam would finally address the uh, elephant in the room. The mistake, as he refers to it. I made a mistake. It led to cast members deciding to end their working relationship with me and the cancellation of the show that we were working on together. I understand their point of view and agree with their decisions to step back. I don't fault anyone who is part of Far Verona's cast for their reactions, and I absolutely accept what happened there is my responsibility. The nature of most content on Twitch is that it's unrehearsed and spontaneous. In role-playing, players work together to create an improvised narrative, and I was doing so in a highly public venue. While yes, Adam does finally take some responsibility and finally reference his mistake as he calls it, he also very slyly attempts to kind of shift the blame on to the nature of like Twitch as a whole, specifically Twitch being this unrehearsed and spontaneous thing. Now, I very much understand wanting to try to explain like your actions and explaining like your views on this mistake that you had made. I mean, we're all human. We all make mistakes and we all falter. But to me, this very much comes off as like very subtly trying to like shift blame away from yourself or at like the very least allude to like some other unseen forces as a reason for your mistake instead of just owning up altogether and being like, look guys, I fucked up. And in light of what he writes in the next seven paragraphs on this blog, this was just like nowhere near good enough. Kobo follows up this section on the mistake by playing victim, wallowing in self-pity for the immense amount of hate that he had been receiving online for his actions and for his cancellation. Kobo saying that he feels unsafe and due to this backlash, he is now afraid to take any creative risks at all. I continue to be the recipient of hate, vitriol, and targeted abuse both in public and private spaces. I'm being emailed anonymous threats of harm if I ever return to broadcasting or attend a convention. Messages telling me I shouldn't exist at all, let alone be allowed to come back. Those voices influenced the people responsible for my contracted work. They led to Roll20 canceling Roll20 Presents and Jace Bellerin Must Die. They led to Andrews McNeil Publishing canceling the last two episodes of Eat the Rich. My mistake started an avalanche of cascading collapse, fueled by the most aggressive cruelty I've ever experienced. I don't feel the trust and support necessary to take creative risks in present in the broadcasting space I belong to. Imagining my future, it's impossible to feel confident or safe returning to those long days creating the way I used to. Now, look, as much of a clown as this guy is, no one deserves like death threats or like this type of like intense hate. Unfortunately, though, this is just kind of a nature on the internet. People can hide behind anonymity and they're going to say heinous, horrible things to you. I mean, I'm a tiny content creator and I've even gotten like waves of hate and vitriol uh, into my inbox, you know, even death threats before, which is it's just something insane and just something that you kind of have to accept if you're going to like make content on the internet and be a public figure. My advice to Adam and advice that I've heard from a lot of major figures is that if you're ever embroiled in any kind of like controversy or things like this is you just post through it. The internet has a short uh, kind of lifespan in terms of like what their memory is. And if you can just continue to make content and post through it, eventually you'll end up on the other side, though obviously with a probably much uh, smaller fan base and community. As far as Adam referring to like hateful reactions being the reason that he has lost his contracted work, 
I'm sorry, man, but ultimately, at the end of the day, your actions did that. You did that to yourself. In the world we live in now, companies aren't going to take risks when it comes to, like, brand risks. And the fact that you, of all people, had built your brand around being the guy who promotes, like, consent in this space only to turn around and completely take that consent away from one of your players to RP, if you even want to call it that, RP out some weird SA, like, fantasy sh I mean, come on, man. You only have yourself to blame. From here, Adam goes on in the blog to say that he starts feeling better and he wants to branch out to, like, other creative projects. He then thanks his fans, the ones who have reached out to him with, like, positive messages, and says that he will be stepping away from content creation, streaming, and in general stepping back away from the hobby, from the D&D space. This lasted for all about like one week until Adam put out a tweet promoting his new blog post on GMing, which doesn't really seem like stepping away from the D&D space to me. From here, this seemed like the end of our story for the end of the downfall of Adam Cobell. I mean, a large section of the D&D and tabletop roleplay community now completely hated him and many felt betrayed by him, and it seemed like he didn't want to try to wade through all this negativity and this backlash and continue to post through it. But then, once again, Adam was drawn back into the spotlight with a tweet he put out February 27th, 2021, promoting a new RPG product that was released by another creator. This product was an ongoing Kickstarter for the Perfect RPG, a Kickstarter that at the time of when this controversy started had raised somewhere around $11,000 until suddenly it was cancelled. Why was it cancelled, you might ask? Well, apparently, this was a collaborative project that listed a long list of contributors to the project. These contributors suddenly finding out that one of their fellow contributors was Adam Coville. Apparently, it wasn't public knowledge that Adam had worked on this project. Adam wasn't listed on the names of contributors on the Kickstarter campaign. But you see, on the campaign page itself, the contributors were then listed in reverse alphabetical order by first names, which then put Adam Cobill's name at the very bottom. After this backlash, the Kickstarter campaign was completely scrapped by the creator, Luke Crane, and as a consequence, Adam would delete his Twitter account. Which honestly, I think everyone should just delete their Twitter accounts at this rate. And so this ends the dramatic and cringe downfall of Adam Cobill, one of the largest figures in the D&D space, a man who in just one roleplay scene completely threw away his entire career as a content creator. Adam still exists online today, maintaining a relatively like low profile posting on his Instagram account under a uh, different name. A large portion of his fan base does still exist and does still support him, regularly sending messages to him telling him that they miss him and declaring that he did nothing wrong. But, you know, such is the way of the internet. In many ways, Colbill's downfall mirrors the downfall of another massive D&D content creator, Arcadum. Both had become extremely large influencers and streamers and figures in the D&D space, and both had built their brands on changing the stereotype of an old boys club within Dungeons and & Dragons, and a focus on consent and inclusivity and positivity as a whole. Adam Colville's downfall, though, was ultimately a result of his own actions, a major reveal that he, like Arcadum, did actually not follow the principles that they had built their brands on. At the end of the day, it takes years to claw your way to the top of the mountain of success, but really only mere minutes to come crashing back down to earth. For me, Adam Cobell is a prime reason why I started covering D&D horror stories and doing this series of videos, because the fact that, in a f***ed up way, many of these stories are hilarious, but they also represent a real learning opportunity for the community as a whole. I love Dungeons & Dragons. To me, it's a very important part of my life. I think that Dungeons & Dragons tabletop role-playing games are an awesome, amazing way to make friends, to express yourself, and to put yourself out of your comfort zone and to really learn stuff about yourself. Unfortunately, Dungeons & Dragons as a game also has a lot of pitfalls, a lot of bad actors and just bad behavior, and it's extremely easy, easy to find yourself kind of falling into these kind of bad behaviors as a player. To me, Adam Cobill is a 
perfect warning, a perfect example to DMs and players out there. Adam serves as an example of how something even as lighthearted as like a game of D&D can very quickly turn into something like much more problematic. And in the case of Adam Cobill, one of the most cringe moments I've ever seen on the internet in my life. As always, if you did enjoy this video or you learned something new, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe as it really does help support me uh, and it puts these videos into the algorithm and it helps way more than I think you guys realize. I want to give a big shout out to the Reddit user uh, Dale Nasio for this post that they made on the r slash hobby drama subreddit as they really did an awesome job in summarizing the events of Adam Colbell's downfall as well as archiving and linking a lot of the material that I included into this video. I'll I'll leave the link to that post in the description box down below if you want to go check out the original post. If you did enjoy this video, then why don't you check out some of my other content on screen now, like some of my other D&D Horror Story videos. As always, guys, thank you so much again for watching and continuing to support me. I hope to see you in the next one. Until next time, stay safe out there. Peace. Love. Adieu.